Next from Springfield, we take a tour of the Illinois Supreme Court after its recent renovations. Joining us on the tour is Rita Garman, the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, and Carolyn Taft Grosbel, the Clerk of the Illinois Supreme Court. This runs about 35 minutes. This is the previous courtroom for the 4th District Appellate Court. Now, we worked with CDB back in 2000 to help move the 4th District Appellate Court into the Waterways Building. So this room was restored to its original um, presence, the feel. The, all the tapestries were uh, cleaned. The woodwork was updated. We tried to keep everything as original as possible because that's the goal of this, was to kind of meld in the new but to maintain the old. As you can see behind us, this is the original portrait from, uh, this is our Crabill portrait and it was restored thanks to? Uh, Fred Crabill. Hmm? Uh, it's actually the rendering that uh, Albert Crabill did to get the commission to do the, the murals. So it's a wonderful piece to add to this room. Now, going back again, the tapestries were all cleaned. If you look at the, the mural in the ceiling, that was all very meticulously cleaned to bring it back to its original color, its original luster. So that was very, very important for us. But as Tom Brower mentioned, one of the biggest pieces of the restoration project was to upgrade the heating, the ventilation, and the cooling system, which you're not going to see, but is an, a critical piece for our building. Now, underneath the benches over here, we have the marble benches um, with the grills in front. They did house these very old and antiquated fan coil units. Now, as we upgraded the system, we wanted to make sure that we restored the original marble kept those fan coil units there so that the same look and the same feel is preserved for the building. So it's very comfortable here in the building. It's very cool. Um, the humidification issue is addressed. And we'll see a little bit more of the problems that that created prior to our project over in the Supreme Court building. So we'll go across the hall. We'll go across the hall. Now again, it was very, very important for us to restore everything in this room to its original luster, its original ambiance. Now when I talked in the appellate court courtroom, the humidification issues here presented a lot of problems with all of the woodworking, as you can see. Most important, we had these columns and because the humidification prior to the uh, project was so volatile, these were actually split from the base to the top. You could put your fist through them. That's how much damage this lack of humidification control caused. So CDB 4240 and the contractors were absolutely wonderful to restore those. And now that we have the humidification straightened around, we are good to go. Um, the other showpiece in this room is our mural that's up at the ceiling. Now again, humidification problems cause there to be a plaster bubble actually underneath that mural. So it was really important for us through Harbo Architects, Evergreen was the contractor, to actually peel back part of that mural, fix the plaster underneath it, and then put it back to its original um, pattern. You're, you wouldn't even be able to tell where the work was performed. It's absolutely gorgeous. The other thing in this room, we returned the color palette for the ceiling, for all the trim, back to the original color palette as it was back in 1908. So it was important to bring those very pale tans, the creams, those colors back in to really make the architecture, really make all of the designs pop. Other than that, in this room, everything remained the same. It's the same tables, the same chairs, but it was important that everything was restored back to its original um, aura. Okay, you have the very rare privilege of being in the Supreme Court's conference room. And this is where the court convenes during court term to discuss cases. Now, it's important to look at this room as well as bringing this back to its original color scheme, original, um, aura, if you will. Original table that's been here, um, all of the bookcases, the metal bookcases are still the originals, but we created a second bathroom over here on this side to, ac whoops, excuse me, to accommodate our three female justices. Because I think back in the 1900s, you know, the one was going to take care of the, the gentleman, but we need to make sure to take care of our, our, our ladies as well. So again, a beautiful, beautiful room, um, maintaining the original 
architecture to the extent possible. Here as well, we got rid of the old fan coil units underneath the walls, and CDB and the contractors did a wonderful job just blending the new and the old to make that wonderful. And what's important, on the wall we have a picture of the courtroom as it was in the 1900s, and you can see the lighting in that picture is now very similar to what we have now. So again, it goes right back to trying to restore that building into a, a period-specific um, aura. I think that was separation at that point in time. Now I will tell you a little aside is that with, between our among our colleagues we would discuss whether that was the men's bathroom or the women's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but as more women came in, more of us still worried. <laughs> in this library were packed up and taken off-site during the construction efforts and we are returning them here so thanks go to Jeff Palzik our Supreme Court library please Jeff thank you very much uh, welcome to the Illinois Supreme Court library uh, we were relatively untouched during the renovation from us having just been renovated in 2001 so uh, a lot of the artwork on the ceilings uh, was the the vast majority of what was done during this uh, time. The, uh, the murals were all done in 1908 by uh, Illinois resident Edgar Cameron, and yeah, they represent uh, precedent, justice, jurisprudence, and knowledge, and uh, they've been beautifully restored, uh, as well as, as I mentioned, the ceiling to their original 1908 colors. Uh, our library uh, serves the court's uh, legal research needs. Uh, as well as that of local attorneys. Uh, we serve as the public law library for Sangamon County. Uh, state agencies use this library, especially the, st uh, the Attorney General's office that are over here quite a lot. And uh, our, we have about a 200,000 volume, volume collection and uh, we use that to serve everyone's research needs. Uh, we have a, a staff of five, myself, uh, our head reference librarian, Amanda Chicho, is, is up here. And uh, we, Amanda has uh, an interesting story to share about the, about the murals, uh, kind of a bit of a legend. Well, as you probably heard, uh, the artist Creeble did most of the artwork in the building that um, Edgar Spears Cameron did the artwork here in the library. And the story that I've always been told is that Cameron was upset that he hadn't received the commission to do the entire building. And so Creeble said, I have this artwork in the library. I'm much too busy with the rest of the building. Would you please take this over? And the idea was supposed to be that Creeble was associated with the Art Institute, and the Art Institute wanted their person to be in charge of the artwork. And they supposedly loaded the commission that selected the artist who was awarded the artwork in the building. <laughs> Um, just, can, can I add to that? Actually, um, I found some letters from Cameron to his wife, which pretty much verifies everything she just said. <laughs> uh, if I may ask the uh, architect, Tom, are you still here? Right here. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, uh, comments before about the difficulty or the challenge of placing in a building like this and fitting in a building like this all the the replacement of electrical, air conditioning, heating, et cetera, and some safety systems. Do you want to address that here? And sure. I, would you move a little closer? 
So it may be relatively obvious in this space, but I'm guessing that in other spaces that we've visited already, you haven't noticed things like the fire sprinklers because they've all been uh, inserted into the fabric of the building in a way that you don't notice them so that the historic effect isn't, isn't modified. Um, the other things that you don't see are some of the things that we removed, like conduits that were on the surface of the wall that we no longer have uh, exposed, they're now concealed in the wall. So that overall, we've restored the building to what it was originally. And again, you don't notice any of the mechanical system in this space, but it's all here working and keeping you comfortable on a hot Springfield day. <laughs> so for instance, the sprinklers are, uh, you can see a disc there in that, that corner, cor mm -hmm. and in, in, in the courtroom, for instance, and in the appellate courtroom, uh, it required even more finesse right. to not only put it in the ceiling, but then to keep it uh, consistent with the historical colors, background, et cetera. What was the, uh, where did the money go on the project? What was the big expense? What were the more difficult aspects of the renovation? A lot of the money went into the mechanical electrical plumbing systems because all of that has been replaced. And we'll see that in the basement when we go down there. Um, but much of it then also went towards the spaces that you're going to see um, and that the public sees, these historic spaces in particular on levels one and two. Uh, there was a minimal amount of uh, money spent in more back of house areas like the basement. Uh, and for instance, even the justices apartments upstairs received very little of the expenditures of the project. So I think all the money was spent in the right places on this building. How state of the art are the heating and air conditioning since it may be another 100 years and to what extent would that lower the operating cost of the building? Well, I, I don't know if any mechanical system would last another 100 years, but I would guess that the equipment we put in here will be here at least in 50 years. And uh, you know, frankly, I don't know what the cost analysis is off the top of my head on the energy efficiency, but it's it's much, much more efficient than it was before. And importantly, as was referenced in the courtroom, you can control it so that the temperature and humidity within the building remains more constant. And that helps protect the woodwork, the paint finishes, and just everything in the building, including these books uh, and other collection parts of the collection that we'll see in the basement. Was when, it your, oh. when, you, when you work on a, sorry, when, when you work on a building of this age, how different is it than, say, doing the same project on a new construction or something more relatively new? It's very different. Uh, you discover things along the way when you're doing a historic project that maybe were concealed from view to begin with. You also have limitations in terms of the space that's available for <coughs> sprinklers and ductwork and equipment. So, for instance, above this ceiling uh, required uh, the contractors to get within a two foot space between the structure above and the ceiling. So it's not easy work to install that piping in that kind of space. I was gonna say, was it your firm that um, was responsible for a lot of the historical research or like, you know, when you got to surprises like that, you know, uh, how, how did how you solve those problems? Yeah. Um, I would say it's a team effort. So for instance, at the very beginning of this process, there is and historic evaluation of the building. And that identifies uh, the spaces within the building that are most critical and less critical. And so that's part of what we use as a guide for how to focus the funds available within the building. This is about, I think, close to a $16 million project? Total project budget, yeah, $16 million. Did you come in and or under budget? We're under budget. By how much, Dan? Well, the final accounting's still being done, so I can't give you a specific answer, but I do know we did the two most important things, three most important things. We restored the building to what it was, we did it on time, and we did it under budget. Okay, this is the room where the attorneys will wait prior to presenting their arguments to the Supreme Court. And it's a wonderful opportunity in this room to be able to showcase the previous justices of the Supreme Court of Illinois. And I have to give special thanks to uh, the Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission who took all of these portraits and made them a uniform size um, for proper presentation in this room. And you can see it starts from here and it'll circle all the way around the room. And those pictures show every justice who has sat on the Supreme Court of Illinois. How many are there all in total, do you know? There's 107 portraits. 
um, 114 justices because the seven current justices are not uh, on the wall. What about the doors here, the very ornate wooden doors? Were anything done to these? They were restored, and those are original doors. There's original, all of the doors are original. Where possible, we could save the hardware. We restored that as well and put that back on again. So again, the idea was we wanted to keep the same look and feel of the building. And to be very honest, some of the woodworking and the uh, hardware is just exquisite. So we kept all of that. They're all original to the building. Just a couple of justices to point out. Up in the upper corner here, um, John. Second, Oops, I have to stay second, with you. Second from the right is um, uh, Stephen Douglas, uh, who was famous for you know debating Abraham Lincoln and running for president several times. Um, we have a number of justices who ended up going on to the federal court, ended up going to the U.S. Senate, uh, became governors of Illinois. We have several uh, former governors up here as well. So I mean, uh, the Supreme Court justices um, certainly as as part of their. Uh, political career uh, one step uh, was within the Illinois Supreme Court. Welcome to the clerk's office. I'm Carolyn Tapp Crosball, the clerk of the court. And before we do a little tour, what I'd like to do is uh, provide um, some background and just a brief uh, description of what the clerk's office does. The clerk's office oversees four automated tracking systems. Uh, and primarily to keep track of the court's dockets. The general docket is the primary docket for the court. The MR docket or miscellaneous record handles primarily attorney discipline matters. The um, MD docket handles cases that are filed by incarcerated pro se individuals. And the proposed rule docket uh, operates consistent with the mandate of Supreme Court Rule 3 regarding the promulgation of new Supreme Court rules. Um, since or prior to 2012, the primary way that someone might file a document is they'd walk into our office or they would send them in by mail. And as many of you know, in 2011, the court made e-business in the courts a major initiative. And the uh, <coughs> Supreme Court Clerk's Office then started an e-filing pilot in January of 2012. And after a successful pilot period, um, beginning in March of 2013, allowed all documents on the court's general docket as well as the MR docket to be filed electronically. And since that time, we've seen a, an increase, a steady increase in the number of electronic filings that we're receiving. And it um, makes for a very efficient process, I believe, for both the public as well as our office. In addition to tracking the court's cases, the clerk's office also handles the attorney licensing matters. We process all the licenses here. Um, on behalf of the court and also maintain the master role of attorneys. Um, the clerk's office also, uh, consistent with Supreme Court Rule 68, files all of the judicial ethics statements that are required to be filed each year by the end of April um, here in our office. Currently we're tracking about 960 ethics statements that are filed. The clerk's office also um, handles the filings of certain types of law firm entities that operate on a limited liability basis. Um, each year, the law firms are required to renew their registration with our office, and we're currently tracking about 4,700 law firms. And last year, we successfully streamlined an e-renewal process that about half of the, those law firms utilized very successfully. So we're very pleased about that. Um, the other thing that the clerk's office uh, assists the court with is the attorney discipline matters. The, the um, ARDC was established to handle complaints filed on behalf of the public when an attorney um, may have uh, done something not to their satisfaction. Hearings are held in the commission, but it's only the court that can impose discipline upon an attorney. So those matters are brought before the court and the clerk's office helps ensure that the court has all the necessary information uh, that it needs to make its decisions. How long have, so, did you have transcripts of cases? And if so, how long has that been going on? You mean as far as the court's records? For the oral for, arguments. For the oral court. arguments. I believe we started uh, re video recording those arguments back in the early 2000s, late 1990s. And we have those uh, archived on our website. So you're able to go there and look, look at those. So, 
So we're standing here, this is obviously the public area. Um, so when the public comes in, uh, they'll have the opportunity to file documents there. For the first time, we have uh, space available for someone who might be in a wheelchair. Previously, we would accommodate them at a table uh, in our public area, but we're pleased now that we have a, uh, an ADA compliant uh, available space. We also have here, um, for members of the press and the public that come in and want to review our briefs, um, we have our workstations set up here to utilize and uh, be able to view um, the briefs. And these are cases that are set on the call of the docket for the September 2014 term. And, uh, and then we have uh, our uh, uh, public station for our case management system. So if you want to check the status of a case that's um, conducted there. So just a little bit of a history about this space before we kind of go into the working area. Um, when this building was first opened in the early 1900s, up until about the early 1970, I believe 71 or 72, this space was shared by the clerk and the attorney general. Both were statewide elected positions at that time, and uh, the clerk's office was that office uh, kind of right across there, and the attorney general's office, we'll see when we go inside, um, was on the opposite side. When the Attorney General moved into its current building down the street in the early 70s, um, then the space became just used by the clerk's office. And at that time, there was a major remodeling that was done. And basically, it remained the same from the early 1970s until this current renovation. So we're very pleased that we're able to uh, have a much more efficient space that now meets our um, needs and especially with our electronic needs with all the upgrades of the building it's been a tremendous asset so anyway we'll um, go on in here Carolyn, Carolyn's father was the last elected uh, clerk of the Supreme Court oh, he, was, he, was, was that? he was elected in 1968 and it was a six-year term um, and when the Constitution was changed in 1970, the Constitution then provided that the position would be appointed by the court. So he served until the end of his term in uh, 1975. <coughs> so, yeah. This room so looks totally different in here. Yeah. 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 Did it get like pulled out or something? Is that the office? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was an office back here, but what it was was there was a picture that was longer and then these half gates that were like Because this is like a first, like, yeah. very yeah. noticeable. You know, yeah, obviously it's we've been walking down, it looks totally different. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is you might recall there was a major. Um, box basically in the yeah. middle of the space and it was HVAC so with That's the renovations was, okay. that was able to come out and so it really opened up the space those are major support pillars for the building so those remained but it really did okay. allow us to open yeah, the space up. yeah so so this is the clerk's office and this was the former office used by the Attorney General up until the early 1970s And that is a, was a considered a historic room for purposes of this renovation. So the paint color goes back to the original 1908 uh, paint color when the Attorney General would have moved into this space. How did, how did they determine the paint color? They, uh, Harbo, um, the historic architects were able to go in with cotton swabs and go down to the original paint color and that's how they were able to determine the original paint. And that, built, that uh, room had been paneled at some time, we don't know when, but, uh, and also the ceiling dropped and it was a very dark space to work in. Um, so it's really a lot brighter and uh, functions a lot more efficiently. So over here we have, this is where the miscellaneous record docu docket functions were performed. So we were able to have some nice uh, docket counter available there and, uh, and some space. And then this is the former clerk's office. This is now utilized by the chief deputy clerk. And again, it was another historic space. So the architects made the effort to put it back to its original condition. Um, the hardwood floors in both offices were restored, which was a major change from 
the way the offices were previously. How did you perform your duties while the building was being renovated? Very, uh, very efficiently. We, um, as was indicated earlier, we were able to relocate temporarily into the Herndon building, just down the street at Fifth and Capitol, and uh, we, you know, served our purposes very well. The, we, were you just sorry to come back here? We were very happy to come back. Yes. So, and one thing, um, the the clerk stores all of its uh, the court's closed case files from 1972 to present down in the basement space. And um, I don't know if any of you were ever in our basement previously, but it had a very bad humidity problem. It was very high humidity, which is ideal for storage of court records. And also the plumbing was such that oftentimes we'd have pipes that would break, which again would cause water to spill on the cabinets holding the, the records. So during the renovation, all of those uh, 1972 to present records were taken out of the building in long-term storage, but yet we were able to retrieve them if a member of the public he asked for a set of the briefs or something from a closed case file. Are those all paper or are there any plans to digitize those documents? Um, they're all paper, but in 2012 when we began the e-filing pilot project, uh, we began digitizing, and so now we do have those electronically. And even the records that come from the lower courts, we're scanning those, and it's much more efficient for the law clerks and the chambers. They can have quick access to both the record and the filing. You know, as soon as something's filed, they have access to it. So, it's been very good. So, and then uh, over here we have, this is where the general docket uh, primarily functions. Again, those are the main cases on the court's docket. The MD docket, uh, serving those incarcerated pro se individuals also are handled over here. Um, and then on the far corner is where the law license processing takes place. When, when the uh, justices meet in a session and they'll have a pile of paperwork alongside them, maybe evidence, is that provided by your department? Yes. Yes. All the records are stored here and provided to the court um, to assist them. Is most of your time uh, on that kind of work for current cases or is it more in the historical context of maintaining the records? It's both. It's ongoing. Uh, the new records that are coming in, of course, we're making sure that when a case is ready to be for a decision on behalf of a judge, um, you know, we provide those records to them and notify the justice that the case is ready for processing. But we're also very aware and, you know, very um, cognizant of our responsibilities to maintain all the long-term records. Do you, do you deal with just the Supreme Court or do you also handle the records for the appellate court? We just serve the, the Supreme Court. So the appellate courts each have their own clerk uh, that function in a very similar manner um, as our office. Majority of the dollars for the restoration project involve the heating and the air conditioning system, which is um, previous to the renovation project. We are tied into the steam with the capital complex as well as the chilled water. But what we did is we replaced the air handler unit in this um, room that runs from that wall right by uh, Mr. Kitchen all the way down here. And what that does is that's the primary source to provide fresh air to maintain the humidity throughout the building and to keep all of our systems very constant. And again, there are, you can see the ceiling is exposed. This is where we have all of the duct work, all of the electrical, um, oops, I'm sorry, throughout the entire building starts here and then goes up through the rest of the building. So this is the primary cost for the project, again, based on that humidification need. Of course, the Supreme Court was housed in the Capitol. Uh, so when they would come down for court, the, it was rumored that some of the members of the court played poker with the members of the legislature, and that this building became stakes in a poker game. That the the, the thing was, if if the Supreme Court justices won, then they got a new building, and they must have won. So <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but it makes an interesting story. And in keeping with the tradition of playing poker. Um, when they built the building, they built a tunnel from the Capitol to this building so we could just picture that some of the legislators might have come across underneath the street to play cards, but we really don't know that. But we did close off 
that tunnel. Oh, you can't go through there. Uh, it, you can see it, but you can't come through okay. anymore. This is our long-term storage area that Claire Grosball referred to. And as we kind of talk about melding the new with the old, when the floor was taken up in, in order to address some water issues that we had, we realized that as soon as all of the concrete came up, we ran into the water table, which then led us to um, understand a little bit more about the genesis for Spring Street. Spring Street happened to be kind of a reflection of the fact that the water table here is so high. When we took up the concrete, this whole area was flooded. So. 4240, CDB were absolutely wonderful in trying to find long-term solutions for a problem that had plagued the building for a number of years. So there were drainage tiles added here, um, additional concrete, additional... Uh, New sump pit to drain all that water out and remove it so that that should eliminate the problem. Just one of those things when you tear into a building that's 100 years old, you run into instances that you didn't anticipate. Was there much mold problem when you came down here? There was, um, because of all the moisture from the, sp the spring coming through the walls, migrating through the concrete walls, but also then the lack of humidity control in the building. And what, how did you mitigate that or eliminate it? Well, a new mechanical system helps control the quality of the air down here now, and then all of the water in the spring that's beneath the floor here is drained off via uh, tiles that Kathy mentioned to some pit and then pumped away. These can't be the only copies of um, old records, right? I'm going to defer Carolyn. They had a question. These can't be the only copies of the old records, are they? Yes, they are. Uh, everything 1972 to present is here. And then the really, um, anything prior to 1972 is housed over at the state archives. Okay. There's no second copies for any of them. So the original court documents. Okay, if you're ready to bear the heat, Joe, I think we're going to take them out here to talk right. about the outside of the building. It was very important for us as part of the renovation project to really focus on the security and the safety of our justices. The parking lot had a new entranceway added off of Capitol Street, which now will allow fire trucks, emergency vehicles, things like that, to come right up to the building in case there's a medical emergency. That was very, very important to us. Um, Bob Shea, our Supreme Court Marshal, can talk a little bit further about the security issues involved, but. As you can see, we have new windows that have blast protection to provide even more safety and security for our justices. The grills on the top are original to the building. They were uh, restored to their original colors. You can also see over here to our left, we have a generator, which was not here before, which is diesel, and it will provide um, electricity and security capabilities as long as we fill up that tank. So it's ready to go 24 hours, but we can maintain the security and the safety and the humidification, ventilation, all of those important support systems through our generator here as well. Bob? Okay. Just first to comment on the, on the parking lot. You can see how easy access we have off of 2nd Street, and we have an exit over here into the alley, so there's a flow of traffic coming through before this this parking lot when it was occupied was really made you landlocked and one thing we always stressed since i've been here is we need two exits or two ways of egress so that if we needed to get somebody out they'd get out quickly secondly most importantly you could not get a fire truck back here on this side of the building when the lot was occupied let alone a box type ambulance could not make could not maneuver and navigate this parking lot and get up to this door. So with this improvement, that has accomplished that tremendously. As well, it's it's limited access to this parking lot, but it hasn't totally restricted it. Uh, it's just a controlled lot. It's, as you can see, all the other cars on the other side of the lot are AG, Attorney General's uh, staff, and this road here uh, belongs to the Supreme Court staff and uh, uh, other officials park back here when needed. You mentioned the blast resistant windows. Twofold purpose for that. It is definitely, you can conjure up the uh, idea that it's for bomb protection, explosions, which it is, 
but it's also very valuable to protect the building when we have really severe weather. I don't know if you can remember, some of you may, uh, before 2000, like late 90s, there was a tornado in town, but the winds here ripped the, the roof off the Supreme Court building. These mm -hmm. windows are designed so that they will not fall into the building. Matter of fact, they're pretty rugged, and they'll also stop debris fly, flying around in severe weather. That's a very important thing. We'll get more of that in Springfield than we do bombs. So, and they're very energy efficient. I can attest that since we've been back. You can't hear outside the building what's going on. So, that's the twofold purpose of those windows. And it, it does does help and, and secure the building and make it safe for its occupants, especially our justice. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 